So I just came across this new tool for visualizing Rust lifetimes, and it's probably the coolest Rust tool I've seen this year. Rust has a very steep learning curve, and arguably the biggest pain point for newcomers is ownership and lifetimes. To fix this problem, the official Rust book provides these nice code comments to help you understand lifetimes. And Brown University's fork of the Rust book also shows you memory layouts visually, which is really nice. These additional hints can be helpful, but understanding ownership and lifetimes in a real Rust code base is still a pain in the butt. That's why this new tool called Rust Owl was created. Before I talk about how this tool helped me in the code bases I'm working on, let's go through a simple example to see how this tool works. Here we create a string and then a result variable. And then inside an inner scope, we create another string and then set result equal to calling the longest string function, which takes in two string slices and returns the longest string. And then finally, outside of the inner scope, we print out result. Now this code does throw an error. And if I turn on error lens, we can see the error in line. String two does not live long enough. I can also toggle hints for some more context. So here we see string two is declared inside the inner scope, and then it's dropped at the end of the inner scope. And because result could potentially be pointing to string two, we can't print out result outside of the inner scope after string two has already been dropped. Now, if you're new to Rust, this could still be confusing without clear visuals. While this new tool called Rust Owl allows you to visualize ownership movement and the lifetime of variables directly in your editor. So if I click on string one, we can visually see that its lifetime lasts until the end of the main function. And if we click on string two, we can see that its lifetime lasts until the end of the inner scope. So the green lines represent lifetimes, but we can see a few other colors. And if I scroll up here, we get a nice legend. So again, green lines represent the actual lifetime of a variable. Purple lines represent immutable borrowing. Pink lines represent mutable borrowing. Orange lines represent moved values. And red lines represent the difference between the expected lifetime and the actual lifetime. So here we can see string two's lifetime. We can also see that it was immutably borrowed here. And then we get this red line down here because string two doesn't live long enough for result to be printed out on line 17. By the way, I'm using the Rust Owl VS Code extension, but it also works on Emacs and NeoVim. Now, if you're a more experienced Rust developer, here's how I personally found this tool to be useful. Here we're looking at an open source Rust library called Bacon, which I highly recommend that you try. And specifically, we're looking at this set result method. Now imagine we're trying to contribute to this library, so we need to understand what this method does. As you can see here, there's quite a bit of code to go through. Well, with Rust Owl, one thing we can do is take a look at the parameters. So we can click on command result and then see its full lifetime. We can see that its lifetime ends here when it gets moved into self.commandResult. And then we can also see where it's used immutably or mutably all without looking at function signatures. So this tool can be very useful when reading through and trying to understand code bases. Another way I've used this tool is as an aid when teaching some of the students I'm working with. One of the biggest mistakes I see Rust beginners make is accidentally creating deadlocks. In this example, we have this vector that's wrapped in a mutex. In this for loop, we get a lock to the vector and then append an element. And then you can imagine there's a bunch of code here before we lock the vector again and append another element. Now this code will create a deadlock and that's because of the way locks work in Rust. On line 14, calling the lock method is going to return a mutex guard, which we store in this lock variable here. The list will automatically be unlocked when mutex guard goes out of scope. But as you can see, lock lives until the end of the closure, which means on line 19, we'll create a deadlock because we're trying to acquire a lock to a resource that is already locked. Now, there are a couple solutions to this. In general, you never want to hold a lock more than necessary. So one thing we could do is create an inner scope and then move this code inside of that inner scope. Now you can see lock is dropped at the end of the inner scope. So the resource will be unlocked after line 17 and on line 21, we are able to acquire another lock. The other solution is simply not storing mutex guard in a variable. In this example, the lock will be dropped at the end of line 14. That being said, Rust Owl is not perfect. There are still some features to be added. For example, integration tests don't work with Rust Owl, which is something I would personally want. And at least as of this video, it doesn't provide visuals to help you understand the relationship which generic lifetime annotations create. But this is only the first iteration and I'm sure this tool will improve with time. If you'd like to check it out, I'll leave a link to the GitHub repo in the description below. And in addition to this tool, make sure to get your free four day Rust training at letsgetrusty.com slash bootcamp. And then click here to watch this video, which YouTube thinks you'll love. I'll see you in the next one.